We are going to start uh, our discussion with Mr. Leung Chung Ying. I, I hope you understand my pronunciation of your name. Uh, Mr. Leung Chung Ying is a very distinguished uh, inhabitant, if I may say so, from Hong Kong. And as you will see, I mean, you, maybe many of you know, know him already because I think this is the third, is it the third or the second, third, third time you're uh, attending the World Policy Conference. But as you will see, he speaks English with an Ox Oxfordian whoa, whoa, whoa. Uh, accent, <laughs> uh, which is uh, uh, quite uh, impressive. You are not yet uh, Sir Chung Ying, no? Not yet. You are sir? not Sir. You were not knighted. No, we are not part of the UK now. <laughs> no, but you could have been before uh, knighted. <laughs> but anyway, so we have a half an hour for a conversation. Uh, we will speak a little bit of, uh, of Hong Kong, of course, but uh, I, I, I think Mr. Uh, Leung would be uh, also uh, pleased to say a few words about uh, China itself. But uh, let me <coughs> start with, uh, with Hong Kong, because after all, you were the chief executive of uh, Hong Kong relatively uh, recently. I mean, the, uh, since you, there were two more, uh, and uh, carrying the coming one, Mr. John Lee Ka Chu, is the successor of your successor. So le let me uh, uh, start by asking you uh, what uh, well, there were strange declarations in the past few uh, months about about Hong Kong. For instance, uh, your uh, the, the current uh, uh, chief executive uh, said uh, recently that uh, the uh, exiled, I quote, exiled uh, dissidents should live in fear. He said, "I told you so." Uh, you have, you have never heard, no. but you heard from me because I told you that on the <laughs> phone. Uh, so, but uh, even if you don't know uh, this, uh, uh, the, 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 this word of your successor, success of your successor, it, it seems that uh, the, since uh, especially the last four or five years, Hong Kong has changed a lot and probably much uh, faster than uh, anyone uh, abroad uh, expected. So could you uh, comment uh, on uh, those uh, changes um, uh, as if uh, uh, the, uh, the, the slogan, you know, one country, two systems was uh, already uh, uh, finished, was already left uh, aside. So is there a future in Hong Kong for the concept of one party, two systems. One country, two systems. Yes, thank you, thank you. Um, the first recommendation that I always make to our friends in the international community who cares about Hong Kong, China, one country, two systems, is that please come and see us. See, see it for yourself. Um, you walk the streets in Hong Kong and talk to uh, shopkeepers and taxi drivers and, and whatnot and sort of find out young view on things in uh, Hong Kong. Um, one country, two systems is no longer a broad concept ever since 1990 when the basic law was promulgated. We had five years of drafting. Um, since China and the UK signed the joint declaration on the question of the future of Hong Kong, in that, in that five years, I was uh, Secretary General of the Basic Law uh, Consultative Committee, and we had 180 members from all walks of life, including British civil servants. Um, so anyone who's interested in the actual implementation of one country, two systems, Hong Kong people ruling Hong Kong with a high degree of autonomy and a promise of 50 years of no change, should actually get a copy of the Basic Law I mean, one could very easily with your handphone now. I mean, you could so Google it. Um, is there the Chinese version, English version, and read the basic law um, from Article 1 to Article 160. So whenever um, foreign governments, including British government, 
claim that China is going back on the promise of one country, two systems, etc. Um, I would say, and openly say, um, tell me which article, which article you think the Chinese government and the Hong Kong government, Hong Kong SL government, are not sort of implementing. Um, I should also mention that the basic law, which is the constitution of Hong Kong, is subject to and has been subjected to judicial review in the courts of Hong Kong. And the courts of Hong Kong have handed down decisions against, in some cases, the Hong Kong government. So I don't think it's a, it's a question of um, anyone's interpretation of these broad words, um, one country, two systems. It's a question of whether the law has been followed. And the law was promulgated 23 years ago, 33 years ago. Thank you very much. But uh, on this question, uh, one country, two systems, of course, uh, it used to be mentioned for Hong Kong and for Taiwan. <coughs> the big uh, issue uh, now on the uh, international scene is, is Taiwan. And uh, many uh, commentators uh, from uh, outside China uh, consider that the evolution in Hong Kong, the repression <coughs> of um, the uh, political uh, movements of the last few years uh, would be uh, a very bad example from their viewpoint uh, about the uh, possible evolution of, of Taiwan. So could you comment uh, a little bit uh, on your own interpretation, on your own view of uh, Taiwan as compared to Hong Kong. So, of course, you will start by saying, I suppose, that it is a totally different situation. So, uh, could you uh, elaborate further on that? Yes, I will. Uh, thank you very much for bringing up um, uh, Taiwan, uh, which is an important subject. So far, this morning, uh, we had very useful discussions on the changing world order, um, world economic order, and um, Sino US relations, um, but so far until now, uh, Taiwan has not been mentioned. Taiwan is important because China has been saying this all along, that uh, Taiwan is a core of core Chinese national interest. And that's what the Chinese side said in the Bali Accord, which the Chinese Foreign Minister, Mr. Wang Yi, made reference to when he met, I believe it was last week, 27th of October, President Biden. So no one should ignore uh, Taiwan, anyone who's interested in, um, in, in the current or the, the new world order uh, should ignore uh, Taiwan. It is a crucial issue for China and therefore in any bilateral or multilateral relations uh, where you find uh, China. The history of Taiwan, of course, is different from the history of uh, uh, Hong Kong. Um, Taiwan was ceded under the Treaty of Shimonoseki. Uh, Hong Kong was ceded to the British under the Treaty of Nanking and Taiwan to the uh, Japanese in 1894. Um, and China was made to pay 7.5 million tails, sorry, 7.5 million kilograms, 200 million tails of uh, silver as war reparation to Japan. And Taiwan was ceded to Japan. And no one has ever disputed uh, that, China, that Taiwan was part of uh, China. Alongside Taiwan, Liaoning Peninsula was also ceded to Japan. And Liaoning Peninsula is now part of China. So why isn't Taiwan? Liaoning Peninsula is now Liaoning province of China. Um, China took Hong Kong back from British um, under the Sino-British Joint Declaration in 1984. Um, Japan lost the Second World War. The Kuomintang Party lost the Civil War with the Communists and retreated to Taiwan. So there's no question of anyone in China. It's not just the ruling party of China ever allowing Taiwan to go independent. Much in the same way as Deng Xiaoping said to Margaret Thatcher in 1982, 
that the people of China will not allow China to agree um, the ongoing um, rule of Hong Kong by the British. Equally, today as ever, the 1.4 billion people in China who never allow the ruling party, the Chinese government, to let go Taiwan. So it is an important issue for the international community to, uh, to understand. And China should not be, uh, Taiwan should not be encouraged in any way to ever think about independence. Now, that's a very important part of any equation in the world order involving China. And um, I, I haven't answered the question about uh, one country to system. I say the same thing to our friends in Taiwan. Now, take out a copy of the Hong Kong Basic Law. And again, go from Article 1 to Article 160. And let's f go through these articles one by one and, uh, and listen to the Taiwanese people, which article is not acceptable and which article I is acceptable. For, for example, Hong Kong is allowed to remain as a member of WHO, which Taiwan wants to be. Hong Kong is allowed by Beijing to be, to be a, a member of WTO, which Taiwan wants to be. Would they object to these clauses? Probably, probably no. Hong Kong, under the basic law, has our own passports. We have our own currency, which is freely convertible with the Hong Kong dollar. Would the Taiwanese disagree with this? I don't think so. So let's find out what articles there are in the Hong Kong Basic Law that the Taiwanese find not acceptable. And let's talk about them. Let us remain a, 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 a few more minutes on, on Taiwan. You see, don't you think that uh, everything would be much simpler if the uh, population of Taiwan was massively uh, in favor of a quick reunification with uh, mainland China, but this is not the case. So how do you uh, explain that? And how do you in China, if I take your mainland China hat, uh, how do you uh, see the legal uh, principle of uh, self-determination? Because after all, you know, from a classical democratic standpoint, uh, if a population in a certain uh, territory uh, wants to become independent, uh, after all, it is up to the population to make up its mind, to decide. So uh, obviously this is not the point of view of, 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 of China. So how, wh how, what is your argument to, about that? Um, to your last point, my experience is that that point has not been allowed to the people in Northern Ireland, nor in the Scottish devolution process. So it isn't just uh, um, the people in one part of the country saying, hey, we have uh, voted, there's a referendum or opinion poll, uh, we want to be independent and bye-bye. I don't think it ever works like that. Um, uh, I've been reading uh, two Taiwanese daily newspapers uh, every day for 30 something years. It is important for the two sides to communicate and for the Taiwanese people, the two point, uh, 26 million people who live on the island, to understand the mainland's position, the Chinese government's position, and real life on the mainland. Um, and I think we could use a lot more people-to-people -people dialogue between the two sides, <coughs> which is something that I've been facilitating myself. Um, and uh, again, people need to see for themselves what lives about uh, political, social, economic lives about um, on, the, on the mainland. Um, and that's something that I think we're not doing enough. But if we, if, if we stay one minute at the example of Scotland, you know, in, in the case of, of, of Scotland, there was a referendum years ago that was authorized by London and of course the uh, independent party lost the referendum yeah. but uh, there never was any 
action from London to suppress uh, opposition uh, to independence in uh, Scotland. Whereas, uh, uh, in the case of, uh, if we go back to Hong Kong, our understanding, we may be wrong, but if we are wrong, please correct, is that uh, it's extremely difficult today in Hong Kong to uh, um, demonstrate or to develop an opposition party. Uh, as you said, the referendum on Scotland was authorized by London. Yes. Beijing is not authorizing a referendum on Taiwan. Secondly, Scotland has a very different history compared to Taiwan. The United Kingdom is called the United Kingdom for good reason, for, histo for historical uh, reason. Um, so I don't think we should make sure draw a direct comparison between the two, but anyway, um, I think the world agrees that Taiwan is part of China. Um, inter interestingly, or, or um, revealingly, uh, the official airline of Taiwan is called, surprise, surprise, China Airlines. So there's no, no question of independence, there's no question of self-determination. And I think um, uh, the Taiwanese people should know, um, and the international community should know, the determination of China uh, to keep Taiwan as part of China. So my last question on this issue, but you understand, you know very well that it is an extremely important issue for China, of course, but it's also an extremely important issue for the future of international uh, relations. Now, in uh, our understanding, when I say our understanding, I think uh, from uh, outside, uh, is uh, that uh, President Xi Jinping, in various declarations over time, has given the impression that uh, he uh, would like the issue to be resolved sooner rather than later, and perhaps uh, as uh, early or at the latest, maybe in uh, 2049, that is on the 30th, the 100th uh, anniversary uh, of, the, of Mao's uh, victory. <coughs> Uh, 2049 is uh, tomorrow, politically speaking. It is uh, 25 years from now. So how should we, should we understand that there is a time limit uh, for the ultimate uh, solution of the problem? Or uh, could we interpret the uh, situation as possibly lasting for another 50 years or so? Um, the ruling party in Taiwan um, may not have that patience. Um, their inclination to declare independence has become more and more obvious. Now, saying that Taiwan is part of China and at the same time, uh, dragging one's feet, um, trying to maintain the status quo for another de decade, for another two decades, and more or less forever, is basically committing a contradiction in terms. Um, so the two sides have to come to together. And to your earlier uh, question, the central government of China has always paid a great deal of attention to public opinion on, the, on, on Taiwan, uh, much in the same way as they paid importance to or pay attention to public opinion in Hong Kong when we drafted the Hong Kong Basic Law. It took five years. It was a big committee of 180 of a secretary of 30-something people worked on it for, um, for five years. So I think the, these are the processes that will probably take place. Um, and obviously, China uh, has never uh, given up the option of using force to reunify the country, if necessary. Well, you know, uh, the WPC, which now you know a little bit, is a place where we can discuss friendly uh, issues which are complicated oh. and where uh, it's not always easy to, to, to agree. Uh, uh, 
so in that uh, spirit, um, I would like to ask you the following question. Clearly, the regime in uh, China has become more and more authoritarian uh, since uh, President Xi Jinping uh, came in power, and he seems now to concentrate uh, all powers in an unprecedented uh, way since uh, uh, Mao Zedong, and perhaps even uh, more successfully than Mao, because uh, Mao was in serious domestic difficulties for, uh, during part of his term. So uh, I have a, a, a simple uh, question because you deal a lot also with economic issue yourself, you know, in the Hong Kong uh, area and uh, beyond. My question is the, is the following, you know, I, uh, it seems to somebody like me that uh, part of the economic success of uh, China has been related to the relatively liberal approach of uh, President Xi's uh, predecessors. <coughs> now, uh, the regime is more and more authoritarian. All this uh, authoritarianism, authoritarianism is also expressed vis-a-vis -vis business people. Now, uh, it's very difficult if you're a businessman, especially if you run big, big companies, to be uh, constantly uh, under political uh, pressure with the uh, possibility someday just to disappear and reappear after six months or never reappear at all. So uh, our, our perception is that uh, it, it, may be, uh, uh, it may create some serious difficulties for the future of uh, Chinese uh, capitalism. Uh, so the question is, uh, don't you believe, or some people believe, even the good loyal communist uh, members of the Communist Party, that uh, excessive political uh, pressure on the business community could be detrimental to the future of uh, economic growth? And if, if such is the case, uh, that uh, in the competition between uh, China and the United States, and more generally with the, with the West, uh, this uh, tendency uh, could uh, slow down uh, the, the pace of uh, uh, economic uh, development in China with some very serious uh, consequences. I've, I've been reading uh, reports and commentaries that are very similar to what I just mentioned um, in Western media and also in Japanese media too. But that's not my experience. Um, in the past six years since I left the position of uh, Chief Secretary of Hong Kong SR government, I spent more time on the mainland of China, not just the Sun provinces, but also outlying regions, provinces such as Xinjiang, Heilongjiang, uh, Ningxia, and so on. I spent more time on the mainland than in Hong Kong. And that's not my experience. That's what I s not what I see and that's not what I, what I hear. Um, I'm one of the vice chairman of the National Committee of the CPPCC, it's quite a mouthful. Um, the Chinese People's Political Cons Consultative Conference, which is one of the four uh, organs in the Chinese political structure. You have the Communist Party, you have the government, you have the National People's Congress, which is legislature, and then you have the, you have the CPPCC. The composition of the Chinese political structure uh, in this way is very different from anyone else you can find in the world, in other governments. Um, in my position as one of the vice chairman of CPPCC National Committee, I do not feel that the last 10 years have been, has been more authoritarian. Um, I just came down from uh, Beijing, arriving early in the morning uh, today uh, in Abu Dhabi. And in um, Beijing, we had two and a half days of very full and very intensive discussion on green development. The government people were there, they were asked questions. We had 300 people at the plenary sessions, and then we had nine subgroup discussions. I don't think it's a manif manifestation of authoritarianism. Uh, at all. Um, 
And in terms of business investments, we're still seeing a thriving uh, private sector. The private sector now accounts for more than half of the country's GDP. Okay, you have big state-owned state enterprises that have been partially privatized by listing on the Shanghai Exchange, the Shenzhen Exchange, and the Hong Kong Stock Exchange. Um, you also see a lot of Hong Kong money going into the mainland China, particularly the Greater Bay Area, which covers nine cities in the Guangdong province, Hong Kong, Macau. Thank you very much. Last question. Uh, <coughs> what uh, lessons do China uh, take from the Ukraine war? Of course, my question is related to the thinking, strategic thinking about Taiwan. But uh, China is not Russia. Um, Taiwan is not Ukraine. China's position uh, on this conflict has been so clearly uh, spelled out. Um, I, don't, I don't even think the ruling party, which is pro-independence in Taiwan, would themselves compare the cross-strait relations and the possibility of an armed conflict, if it happens, uh, to the situation in, um, in Europe between uh, Russia and uh, Ukraine. I don't think they would ever uh, think it in those terms themselves. So, we have uh, 58 uh, seconds left. If someone would like to ask one concise question, <coughs> I was absolutely sure that uh, there would be, well, uh, I, I take the question from an expert uh, of, uh, of, uh, of, of the region, Mr. Cabestan. Well, good morning, uh, Mr. Liang. Plus près, plus près du micro. Okay, I'm, I'm maybe the, the, only, the only one in the room uh, who share with you the fact that I'm a permanent resident of Hong Kong. I've been in Hong Kong for 25 years. And I have a very simple question. After the protest movement of sure. 2019, the protest movement of 2019, don't you think that the Hong Kong government has not made in, enough effort to foster reconcili reconciliation within the society. I feel that the Hong Kong community is very divided today. So do you think the Hong Kong government could have done more to foster reconciliation among the various segments of the Hong Kong society? There were protests, but there were very serious riots as well, uh, inflicting bodily harm um, on fellow civilian citizens and, of course, policemen. And these people were apprehended, they were brought to justice, and they were sentenced uh, by the law courts. There was no question of the administration saying that we could turn a blind eye to people who broke the law under those circumstances. And they were very, as we could all see on uh, TV footages, very serious uh, offenses, um, maiming and killing and destruction of properties. Well, no, one sentence, one sentence. So my, my question, sir, in one sentence is that uh, why China, which is uh, so willing to preserve the international order and the international institutions like UN, WTO, and so on, or the international institutions, why China does not recognize the authority of the permanent arbitrary tribunal of The Hague, which is, as you know, older than the United Nations it's, uh, from the 19th century, which said that the, the separation, the separation uh, of uh, uh, the, uh, the islands in the South China uh, Sea between uh, China and uh, Filipinos. So how is it that a government uh, which wants to protect international order 
and international institutions <coughs> does not recognize the ruling of the permanent uh, arbitrary uh, tribunal of La Hague. China did not take part in the arbitration. Okay, so that was a long question and a short answer. Okay, so uh, thank you uh, very much, Mr. Lung. I think the conclusion of this uh, uh, relatively short discussion is that uh, next uh, year or so we should take uh, six uh, hours uh, discussion to, to cover uh, all the facets of that uh, most important issue for the future of the world. Thank you uh, very much and uh, we, uh, it's now time I think for lunch. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Uh, <laughs>